if we are truly born again and saved, God has a way for us to try to live our life. And tonight I want to share with you four principles that will transform your Christianity. Before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer and trust the Lord's will be done. Heavenly Father, we ask that the Spirit of God will speak to our hearts now. Thank you for your precious word. Use it to further your precious will in our lives as we think about your transforming work and how you change hearts and minds. And I pray that you use the truth of your word to be a blessing, to be an encouragement. Thank you again for all you've done for us. I pray you continue to be with our church family. And we pray the Spirit of God now will give us understanding in your precious word. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This particular chapter only has eight verses, but the principles are plentiful here. I want to draw four for, for tonight. And I believe if you implement this, these truths, they can bring a transformation in your life. Shortly after I got saved, just like some of you, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or creation, and all things are becoming new. For me at that particular time, going to church was not something I did on a regular basis. Praying like it did at that time was not something I practiced. But I have learned by God's grace and mercy that you can be saved and live a Christian life that is mundane. There's no zeal, there's no joy, and there's no purpose. I believe the principles can guide and direct and also just stir up your hearts you know, on general purpose. Here's the first principle I want to share with you, and that is you must give God singing and praise. You say, well, that's what we've been studying, right? That's, that's the idea in the book of Psalms. They are words to sing. They are messages that come uh, to the heart of a person. But look at verse 1, Psalm 100, verse 101, verse 1. I was seen of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I'm not going to labor this particular point, but let me just read two texts. You don't need to turn here. Psalm 30, verse 4, a verse we looked at previously. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints, and give thanks at the reverence of his holiness, or the presence of his holiness. Psalm 149, verse 5, let the saints be joyful in glory, let them sing aloud upon their beds. In the previous message in Psalm 100, we're reminded to enter his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Now, don't answer out loud, but have you sung a psalm between the last time we met? Uh, that would be for us last Sunday, right? And if we don't get in this practice or this uh, on purpose idea of having a song, then I will encourage you, as we have before, grab one of the song books, and it's good medicine for anybody, anyone, and that is learn some of the songs. If not, go online, go on your phone. And the song we just sung uh, just a moment ago, uh, Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Singing, let me just share three thoughts about singing. Singing helps you stay loyal to the Lord. Secondly, singing helps you endure life's challenges. Boy, when things get rough, and they can at times. Thirdly, singing can help you restore the fact that you were saved by the grace of God. Sometimes a life in general can take away some of the experiences that we reflected upon, and we need to go re revisit those experiences. So, so number one, give God singing and pray. Secondly, give all the way, go all the way for God. This is found in verse 2. I would behave my, th myself or thyself wisely in a perfect way. Or when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house 
with a perfect heart. Who is writing this psalm? It says the psalm of David. Who was David? David was a king. And he says here, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Now, when the Bible uses this word perfect in the first verse and in the latter part, it actually has two different meanings here. The first refers to that of turning your heart completely to God. You know, some sometimes as Christians, and I have to include myself in this, is that you might not totally live for the glory of God. That means your heart needs to turn to God wholly and fully. That's the idea of the word perfect here. Have you ever done a combination uh, on a lock and you have to turn the combination one way and then turn it the other way and turn it back to the last number on those old combinations till you got the right number and if the keys line up and then you can open up the lock. Well, God likens our heart to completely turn all the way towards him. As a king, David would is surrendering in a sense. He's not following God as a leader half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly by turning his heart to God. I will behave myself wisely. How? In a way of turning myself to God fully. That's the idea. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? Question. David associated obedience with The idea of the presence of God. If we only want to listen to God sometimes and not all the time, would you say you're following the Lord wholeheartedly? Uh, If we only want to listen to God on Sundays and Wednesdays, or do we want to listen and have a heart turned to him all the time? Kings needed wisdom. Kings needed to behave themselves wisely. And so David understood this idea of being real, being authentic, and having the blessing of God meant to obey what God has to say. Let me read to you a quote. This is a quote by Morgan, a man who preached the word of God, comments on things uh, in scripture. No man is able to make the city in which he dwells anything like the city of God, who does not know how to behave himself in his own house. The first thing for every public man to do who would serve his city for God is to see to it that his private life is ordered aright before him. So going further in verse 2, notice what it says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I know that I can only speak for myself, but have you ever played church in church, gone through the motions? And I think this is, needs to be preached over and over again. True, authentic Christianity begins in our own houses. Not while others can see us, but here the psalmist says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Very important. And in this idea of walking uh, with his heart turned, what, what is he turning his heart to? We talk about God, we talk about the Lord, we talk about Jesus, but what, what makes it practical? Here it is, the very word of God. We turn our hearts to the truth of God. Christianity is about yielding our life to Christ and to the truth of Scripture. So this will be important for us. Who gives wisdom? God gives wisdom. Where is wisdom found? In the scripture, in the counsel of his very word. So go all the way for God. Give God singing and praise. Number three, and this is where the meat of the message is tonight. It's found in verse three and four. Guard your heart and your mind. Guard your heart and your mind. Notice what he says. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. The word wicked there means worthless. It means unprofitable. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, and it shall not cleave to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. 
Now this becomes very interesting because when you look back in the Old Testament days, people would give themselves to idolatrous uh, things, idol worship. There would be things that the king would see. We know that here in Psalm 101, we wish to God that we could say that the psalmist lived this consistently, but we know according to the word of God that he made choices that impacted his life. Remember Bathsheba? Somebody said it doesn't hurt to look, and I would differ with that. Uh, to dwell on something, some, pe- some people would you know, say that if they looked and glanced at a woman that they were sinning, I would disagree with that as well. What I mean was, it's not a sin to be tempted, but you don't want to put your place in a position of temptation and make those kind of decisions that you become vulnerable. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, circumstances are out of our control. But getting back to what it says here, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I'm sure you may be aware of that. Maybe you read a lot of report in preaching and teaching the word of God. I come across this, come across a lot often since the internet is in full blown. Pornography is a major problem in our country and in the world because the access to the internet is pretty easy. And uh, there can be some evil things that are on the internet as well as good things. Uh, This week I was uh, fixing our treadmill. I don't know how to fix treadmills, but guess where I went? I went to YouTube and I found out how to change a bell on the internet on YouTube. It's not done yet. still sitting there and working on it. But let me uh, give you a a verse. Write this verse down. Job 31.1. It says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I have the idea at this point in time in his life that the psalmist David, the king of Israel, made a covenant with his eyes. He said, I was set. That's a decision. I was set no wicked thing before my eyes. In other words, he's positioning his heart and mind such that he has purpose that he will not put himself in a position of sinning and discipline uh, and transgressing the laws of God. Chuck Swindoll once said this, none of us are far from a fall. We're all sinners. We're one decision away from the beginning of a weakness that could lead to a habit that could lead to a fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. By the way, I've learned this in life in general now that I'm a Christian, that if I pay too much attention to something, that it will have an impact, right? For example, what I think about will affect my heart and mind. The Bible says, think on the things that are pure and honest of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The Bible encourages us to abstain from all appearance of evil. And may I say, abstain from anything you see that is wicked and those things that are not right for you. What enters into the eye gate affects our lives affects our mind and the bible reminds us according to the book of corinthians cast down every thought every imagination that goes against the knowledge of god and bringing them into captivity have you have you ever had like a dog that running loose running wild and you had to corral it maybe you got the old dog what is it, the dog leash we've had guests over the years and we've had to if I didn't let that dog uh, or chain and corral that dog to the strap, it went wild. Our thoughts can run wild. And God reminds us we need to corral those thoughts. Here's a book I want to read to you, a quote. Uh, the name of this book is Every Man's Battle by Stephen Otterberg. This is very uh, a serious thing that's going on in, in our world because of the Internet. used to be that I remember when the Internet first came out and Christian authors such as James, Dr. James Dobson and all the marriage counselors were saying, if you have a computer, you put it in the living room because that's where there's public accountability by the family. Now we got Internet on our what? 
phones. You can take it anywhere. You can be all by yourself. And so the the concern for internet usage is, is very, very important for us. This is from a, a little take. I'm just going to read a half a page here, uh, Ansem, from Stephen Otterberg's Every Man's Battle. The title is Your Mustang Mine. As you build the outer def- perimeter, defense perimeters, you'll find that the perimeter of the eyes go up much faster than the perimeter of the mind. Why? First, the mind is far more crafty than your eyes and more difficult to corral. Second, you really can't rein in the mind effectively until the defense and perimeter of the eyes in its place. Knowing this, you shouldn't be discouraged if your mind responds more slowly than your eyes. The great news is that the defense perimeter of the eyes works with you. To build the perimeter of the mind, the mind needs an object for its lust. So when lust, when eyes view sexual images, the mind has plenty to dance with. Without those images, the mind has an empty dance card. By starving the eyes, you starve the mind as well. Although this alone is not enough, the mind can still create its own lust objects using memories of movies or pictures you saw years ago by generating fantasies about old girlfriends or women with whom you work. It's right in this book from a man's standpoint of view. At least with your eyes, you're under control. You won't be overwhelmed by the continuing flood of fresh lust objects as you struggle to learn control your mind. You say, what did he just say there? He said, we have the ability to still think about what we saw yesterday, last year, years ago. And I, and I think about life's experiences. Have you ever seen a billboard and you just kind of blushed? Have you ever seen a magazine, you go to automotive place and there it was. And you just open up Sports Illustrated and boom, there's a there's a woman with a swimsuit on, and maybe it's an advertisement there. You turned on the internet only to see because they're all sharing the ads. There's an ad right there and an ad right there, and you can't seem to get away from that. We need to guard our hearts and guard our minds. And again, temptation is not a sin. You say, what should I do if I shouldn't be looking at something, change the channel. Amen. Uh, we had two channels growing up in, uh, uh, in our, in my area as a little kid. And, uh, one was channel four and one was channel seven. And if we didn't like what was on channel four, we changed it to channel seven, all that black and white television back the, in those days. So God reminds us in this word, and, and this is important. I will behave myself wisely. That would be regards to what I watch. The things I see, the things I hear, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, and it shall not cleave to me. By the way, one of the more important truths that we can all glean from to be able to help us guard our hearts and guard our minds is hide the word of God in our heart. Amen. Uh, John chapter number 8, verse 31 and 32 tell us this. And as we study this out, this is great. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, if you continue in my word, key word, continue and make it a lifestyle. Then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Having a Bible in my house is not going to protect me from evil, but reading the Bible and becoming a doer of the word, continuing it, will help me to live a life of victory and freedom from the power of sin. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? So God can use this word. Circumstances come by, change the channel. Uh, Don't put yourself in a situation where the lust of the flesh will get to you. Know your own self. Because sometimes it's easy to trust in yourself. Well, let's go to point number uh, four here. We mentioned, we're mentioning four things that can transform your Christian life. Give God singing and praise. That's what we've been reading over and over again in the book of Psalms. Go all the way for God. Turn your heart completely towards him. We're talking about, about the psalmist, David. David, you need to be a good king. Turn your heart all the way to God. He's saying, I will, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Reminds me of when the kids were small and uh, 
One of my daughters brought this to my attention. I don't know if you've ever seen Wizard of Oz. You know that that lady, the Wicked Witch, <laughs> the lady with the green face. That was a terrorizing moment for her. She still remembers that. And that we we didn't have television back then. We just watched those VHS uh, uh, Disney films, and that was still that was traumatic for her, according to what she said. But protect, guard the gate of your heart, guard your heart and your mind. Make a covenant with your eyes. I won't look at something that would lead me down a pathway. You say, what if you do? Confess it, forsake it, turn back to God. Amen. Uh, remember, temptation is not a sin. We're all going to be tempted. There's some things that are out of your control. Here's the last one. And this is a very uh, interesting passage in Psalm 101. But categorize your relationships. You can group your relationships. As Christians, I think we ought to have compassion for everyone, but we are required to walk wisely, use some discernment. So basically, when you read in verses 4 to the end of the chapter, there's two groups of relationships here. Let's read them. David's talking. David's being used by God to write this psalm. He's going to be a king. Verse 4, A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person who privily slandered his neighbor. Him will I cut off, him that hath an high look, and a proud heart will I not suffer. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. And then he mentions, I would early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Categorize your relationships. It it comes down to two groups. Those that you don't trust and those that you trust. Okay? It's pretty simple, but yet profound and powerful. This could transform anyone's life because the Bible reminds us that Evil communications corrupts good manners. What we entertain and what we allow, especially in our social interaction, can affect us. What people's moods, what people say, what people do. Look at verse number four. He mentions a forward heart. That's a proud heart. Look at verse number five. Who so privily slander it? They say things that are not true. They say things behind people's back. Uh, Look at verse number seven. He that work a deceitful. And verse seven, the latter part, he that telleth lies. If someone tells lies to you about somebody else, I can almost guarantee they'll tell lies to somebody else about you. If somebody slanders somebody else to you, it will be only a matter of time before they slander about you. You and I have to be careful. And I'm not saying you need to excommunicate them because we want people to be saved. But I'm simply saying that in your heart, in your mind, God can lead you to say, okay, I got to be careful because that person slanders people. That person lies about people. That person has a very haughty heart. They think they're better better than anybody else. So that's probably not the person you're going to trust the most, okay? But there are those, thank God, that you can trust. And the psalmist reminds us here in verse number six, mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me and he that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. The king was kind of picky, would you say? There are some people that he called faithful and those I believe are the ones that we can trust. There are some people that we're, we're going to have to work with them and, and you say, uh, what does it mean to... Uh, Trust someone. Well, decisions are made, right? It's like when you were a kid, I had this experience. My dad said, you come home at 10 o'clock with the truck. And as long as I brought the truck back at 10 o'clock, he trusts me to have the truck the next time. But the time that I brought the truck home at 1 o'clock in the morning, he said, you're not driving the truck. And as a matter of fact, I'm not going to give you the keys. 
Uh, if your mom and dad can give you 10 bucks and say, go after uh, two loaves of bread, and, and the first time you bring back all the correct chain, and they say, 10 bucks I can give you to go get two loaves of bread, but the next time you give them only a dollar, and you say, what happened to the rest of it? I don't know. I thought I put it in your purse, and you lied about it. Next time they might just give you $2 and not 10 and say, I can't trust you with the 10 because you didn't bring back the rest of the money. Stuff we all deal with, and God, in a similar way, wants to trust us with more, per se. God wants to trust us with His wisdom. God wants to trust us with relationships. God wants to trust us even with material goods. But He sees it all. And like the great king He is, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding evil and good. The psalmist reminds us, My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. This is the group that he trusts. These are the group that he's inspired and encouraged by, that they may dwell with me and he that walketh in me. By the way, for anyone that we can, can't trust right now, trust can be earned and cr- trust can be worked with. And thank God for that because that gives everybody hope. There's a starting point And uh, we thank the Lord for God's grace, even for those moments in our own lives. So in closing... Do you think these could help anyone's Christian life to be transformed? By beginning to give God singing and praise, by turning their heart, going all the way for God, not turning their heart halfway, but all the way towards God. How about this? By guarding their heart and their mind, guarding the gates of their soul, being careful what you allow in, and by categorizing, grouping your relationships with discernment, down to those you can trust and those you can't trust. I believe if you follow the principles of this psalm, that all of us can be blessed in a greater, greater way. As a king, that David will be, he will be faced with temptation. Someone said, power often exposes the flaws of character if it does not actually create them to happen so i would be in agreement with what the what paul said in first corinthians 10 12 wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall let's pray our father and our god we thank you that you have all power to change our lives each and every day we thank you for this precious truth that we have read tonight and i pray that lord you'll help us to continue to sing praises Continue to honor you with singing, honor you with our praise and thanksgiving. I pray that we'll not wait to the next church service, but God in our hearts that we'll willingly do so each day for you are worthy. And God, for the truth that we have and to hold on to help us to turn our hearts completely to it, to yield uh, to the scripture and Lord to the word of God. Thank you that you promise you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you to the power of the Spirit of God. You are working your perfect will in our lives. And oh, oh God, help us to be careful, Lord, to not focus upon things that are worthless, things that are unprofitable, things that are useless and evil. Help us to keep any wicked thing before our eyes. Rather, Lord, help us to focus on those things that are profitable, to dwell on the things that are right. Lord, to... Pay our attention to you and all your goodness. Now, God, we ask that you would give us discernment, even as a king would, and how he would discern between those that would lie, those that would slander, those that would be proudful, and those that would be faithful. God, I know you work just like this, and I pray that you'll help us to be faithful in the smallest of things. And Father, we'll give you praise. Use us this week for your honor and glory. Amen.